Any questions? That looks like a no. I don't see any hands or hear any voices. No questions here. Okay. Um, so, what I want to talk to you about basically is, is how you would store this matrix and how you would operate on it. So this, if you've done any kind of sparse matrix or sparse graph methods, this should be very familiar to you. It's probably the most common way of storing sparse matrices. It's got various names. The most common, I think, is compressed sparse row. Essentially, the idea is take all the non-zero entries in the matrix and lay them out linearly in row major order. That's the, the line of the data structure that I'm, calling, that I'm calling data. So if you compare the matrix at the top with the data values at the bottom, it's just every row concatenated together, and I only record the non-zero entries. Below that, I have a, a parallel corresponding array that just gives the column index for every one of those non-zero entries. And then finally, the last row, that what I'm calling the row pointers, just says, where in that list of non-zeros does each row start? So those are just index offsets. Row 0 starts at entry 0. Row 2 starts at entry 2. Row 3 starts at entry 5. And I record a 7 at the end so I can maintain the invariant that the length of the row, i, is just pointer i, uh, the difference between pointer i and pointer i plus 1. So that last entry is just the number of non-zeros. And this is the sort of a canonical way that you would perform the, the matrix vector product using this data representation. You see here there's a loop at the outside which loops over every row of the matrix. And then for every row, we're going to figure out where it begins and ends in that data layout I created. And then I'm just going to loop over every entry in that row and accumulate the appropriate non-zero, which here is called data jj times the appropriate entry of x. And then when I've accumulated all of them, I just write it out at the end into the appropriate slot in the output matrix, y. So the natural question is, how can I take this sequential code, which if, if you think about the program at all, or if, if you're familiar with the problem at all, is probably fairly easy to come upon. Uh, how do I parallelize this? Well, there's one fairly straightforward way to parallelize this, which is simply to take that program and spread out this computation for each row over a bunch of parallel threads. Because if you examine this code, you'll see that I'm looping over all the rows of the matrix. I process every row completely independently. The body of that loop has no dependency on different iterations. Every iteration is completely independent of the others. And so consequently, I can just spread this out over the threads of a kernel. That's a very natural thing to do. And there are, of course, a lot of problems where this is true. You have some loop. And all the iterations of the loop are independent, so it's fairly easy to write the, the CUDA implementation of this in parallel. Um, so as I just said, the easy way to parallelize this is assign one thread per row. And the CUDA code would look something like this. Instead of having a loop over rows, now I just have a single program that will be executed by individual threads. Each thread at the top will determine what row it's going to process from its index information. And then it'll do the appropriate thing. The body of that snippet of code is exactly the same as before. It's just I've replaced a loop with a compute my row, make sure my row is not bigger than the total number of rows, and then do the same thing. Uh, so in particular, if you wrap that all up into an actual executable kernel, this is the sequential implementation. And this is the parallel CUDA kernel. And you'll notice that I laid them out specifically so they kind of lined up. The only difference is this one has a loop and has no host specifier. This one has a global specifier, and it computes what row it is at the beginning instead of having a loop. And this, of course, is also the sort of thing that you would do with OpenMP as well, if you're familiar with that. So if I was parallelizing on the CPU with OpenMP, I would be very tempted to just put this pragma 1p parallel 4 before that loop, which tells the OpenMP system to spread that loop across many threads across all the cores of the machine. And the CUDA kernel basically does the same thing. The only difference between these is sort of the, the syntax or mechanics of, of how you, you tell the system that you want to just take this parallel loop and spread it across many threads. So this is the obvious thing to do, I would claim, at least once you think about the problem at all. And um, of course, you should always do the obvious thing first. 
You know, typically the best programmer is a lazy programmer. And that means you should always do the obvious thing first, because who knows? The obvious thing might actually be the right thing. In this case, the obvious thing actually has some problems. Uh, it, it suffers from both execution divergence and memory divergence. It suffers from execution divergence because different rows will have different number of entries. And so consequently, the amount of work per thread, which is proportional to the number of non-zeros per row, can vary. And, and this is where the point I made earlier about uh, you, you have to understand the parameters of your data comes in. Because if I know that all my rows have roughly the same number of entries, then I don't even care about this particular issue. But if I know I'm processing, say, power law networks where I have an extreme distribution of row lengths and they can vary by orders of magnitude, then I care about this a lot. The other problem it has is memory divergence. Uh, you get very little coalescing in this. Um, if you think about what's happening, uh, the non-zeros of every row are laid out in this linear order. So here are the blocks in this diagram. Uh, every block is, say, a non-zero entry, and the colors are just alternating to show you the, the different rows. So in the first iteration, these different threads in a thread block are going to access the first non-zero in their row, and then the second, and then the third. And if you look at this diagram, what you see is that the, the uh, stride, or the, the memory access spacing between consecutive threads, is going to be a function of the number of non-zeros per row. And unless the number of non-zeros per row happens to be one, that means they're accessing at some stride that spreads out their accesses, which means they don't get a perfect memory access pattern. So they will take a bandwidth penalty for doing this. So if the uh, row length distribution is reasonable, this is actually the main problem with this kernel, that it has a divergent access to memory. So the way we'd like to fix that is to somehow change the kernel to get a better memory access pattern. And I'm going to I'm, I'm going to mention two ways. Uh, the first which is actually probably the thing that you would do if you were writing CPU code, is vectorize this kernel. Instead of having one thread process every row, I can have k threads process each row by iteratively pick up k values, k consecutive values, do the appropriate multiplication, reduce amongst them, and then just repeat. Uh, for those of you who are fans of vector machines, this is frequently called vector strip mining. Although, actually, I don't know why it's called strip mining. But that's what people call it. Uh, and typically, you, know, you could pick any kind of k, but probably it makes sense to pick some power of 2 that's up to the SIMD width of the machine. So when I say k, I basically mean power of 2 between 2 and 32 in this particular case. But th that, that's kind of an implementation detail, an architecture-specific detail. The key thing is you could take some number of consecutive threads and just have them iterate consecutively over the rows of the, the elements of the matrix. And then, now I have consecutive threads accessing consecutive memory locations, which is good. That's what I want. So this will be a, a good strategy if I have a lot of non-zero entries per row and they're all reasonably balanced. Right? The key question here is, are there many more than k entries per row or many fewer? If there are many fewer, I'm actually doing a lot of wasted work. If there are many more, then I'm actually getting good utilization, and this works well. Another option, which again uh, comes straight out of the way you would program a vector machine like a Cray, is to use a slightly different storage format, which for historical reasons is usually called ELL or LPAC. I believe it's named after a particular Fortran code where this, this occurred. Uh, so the idea is this. You take, take your matrix and quantize every row to have exactly k non-zeros per row. Pick k so that it's big enough that every row will actually fit. And then just lay out all the non-zeros in the matrix into each one of the rows of this matrix. So since I've quantized it to k, I'm going to actually build a dense matrix like the one on the right. And I'm just going to pad with you know, whatever invalid entries I want, with zero, say. Um, the non-zero values where there isn't actually an entry in the matrix. So this will, of course, be bad if there's high variation in the row length, but it's perfectly reasonable if I have completely equal lengths everywhere or small variability. Now, the reason I want to do this, this quantization, is that once I've done it, as I said, I, I get what amounts to a dense matrix for both the values and the column indices that I'm recording, which I'm showing here on the slide. <coughs> 
And because it's dense, I can transpose its layout and lay it out in column major order rather than the row major order that I used with the, the CSR format. And this gives you a perfect memory access pattern. Because if you think about it, if I still do this one thread per row, the first step, they will all access the first column of their row, which by construction are all contiguous because I've laid out the data in column major order. And then they'll all access the second element of their row, which again, they're all contiguous. So I get a perfectly coalesced memory access pattern. I get perfect uh, layout, but at the expense of possibly wasting work. In this particular diagram, you know, each one of the stars in those matrices are you know, invalid entries that I'm either wasting space and or work to process them. And uh, you know, as I said, I don't expect you to completely digest this piece of code. But the reason I put it up here on the slide, first of all, is so you can go back and look at it later if you feel like. But also to show you that it's not that big. The, the kind of transformation I've, I've just told you about is pretty simple to do. And in fact, this, this particular kernel goes a little bit further than what I just described. It actually doesn't assign one thread per row. It just launches a bunch of threads, and then threads iteratively pick up rows to process until all the rows are done. And the reason for that is essentially to get slightly better load balance. Right? If one thread has to process several rows, then that tends to smooth out the, the balance of load across all the threads. A relatively minor optimization, but it's a useful one, and it, it adds like two lines of code to this, this particular kernel. So uh, again, I'm showing you this. So you get the sense that optimizing this kernel is not making it extremely complicated. You probably could make it extremely complicated. You could engage in heroic code optimization that involved like trying to minimize the number of instructions and, and tweak other things. But you know, I have better things to do with my time, and you probably do too. There are a few of you in the room who might have time for that. And I encourage you to engage in heroic code optimization so my code runs faster. But uh, for most of us, I think that's not true. The last approach I, I want to briefly mention, and which I'm not going to show you the code for, is another strategy, one which exposes, in fact, a maximal amount of parallelism would be to use a slightly different format, which, which we call coordinate format. Some people call triplet format. Essentially, I can just, for every non-zero entry in the matrix, um, lay it out in row major order again. Again, record every column index. And now, just record along with that the row index of every single non-zero. Right, so I essentially, if you look at the columns of those three matrices on my slide, those are triplets of ijx values, which tell you a one non-zero in the matrix. And I, I can actually, with this representation, easily write a kernel that assigns one thread per non-zero, right? not one thread per row, but one thread per non-zero. Each thread performs a single aij xj product, and then write, uh, performs a big segmented reduction to compute the result per, per row. And as I said, I'm not going to show you that code. You'll see the URL later. You can go look at the code. The reason for doing this is that this particular kernel is largely insensitive to the row length distribution, because it's essentially spreading the work out across all the threads of the machine. It's essentially statically scheduling the work so that it's relatively load balanced. It also exposes the maximal parallelism. But that's actually not a good thing, as, as I'll show you in a second, because the cost of coordinating the results from all these threads, namely every single thread does one multiply add and then has to do a relatively expensive segmented reduction, the cost of that coordination actually makes it perform worse than uh, the, other, the other kernels. The format 